Here's the invitation for today as we're pursuing the gratitude challenge. These are words from Jesus, instructions that he gave to his good friends as he sent them out to do good work in the world. Matthew 10, verse 8, freely you have received, freely give. And we will see those words were remarkably revolutionary in that day and our day still. Freely you have received. There's an old country western song. kind of kills me for some reason when I hear it. A kid comes to uh, mom and gives her a bill. Um, mowing the yard, $5. For making my bed every morning, cleaning my room, you owe me a dollar. For playing with my little sister, you owe me $8, whatever it was. And then lays that bill out there and, and the mom has a thousand memories go through her mind. And she flips that piece of paper over and writes down, for carrying you for nine months as your little life grew inside me, no charge. For sitting beside your bed at night, worrying about you, doctoring you, praying over you, no charge. For making sure that you had food on the table and clothes on your body and toys to play with and a place to be able to learn for all the years of love, no charge. True love uh, comes paid in full. And I suppose that kid had to spend years in therapy dealing with the guilt of that one single interaction, but that notion that uh, love does not charge, love gives freely, was a revolutionary one. You may have heard before some of the uh, unique ways that Jesus and his followers introduced certain virtues into the world. Forgiveness was not generally admired in the ancient world. And, Hannah Arndt said that Jesus Christ was the, the discoverer of forgiveness in human affairs. Humility was not highly thought of in the ancient world. And John Dixon talks about how in Australia, I think it's Macquarie University, found that the biggest single influence on humility becoming a desired virtue was Jesus and supremely Jesus in the cross. Hope was not widely admired, particularly by the Stoics who thought of it as a moral failing because you're depending on something else. And it was primarily through Jesus and his movement that hope became an admired virtue. Gratitude is another one that Jesus impacted deeply, only it's not so much that he introduced gratitude, he revolutionized it. He was actually considered an ingrate. Christians were considered to be ingrates in the ancient world guy by the name of Peter Lightheart in his book, uh, Gratitude and in Intellectual History, writes about this. You may wonder, back before there was money, there was currencies, how did economies work? People will sometimes think it was a barter system. I'll give you this uh, bowl, you give me that food. But actually, uh, that's not quite right. Folks that write about this, Peter writes about in his book, will say that at the heart of ancient economies was the giving of a gift, only not quite gift the way that we think about it. The Romans actually had an expression for this, I give so that you will give to me. And there was what Peter calls a circle of reciprocity, if you can see this. The idea is that there would be a giver. In Rome, that would actually often be called a patron. We'll think about patronage as a political system, but in the ancient world, it was simply the way that the economy worked. Somebody who had more would give a gift uh, in quotation marks because that always came with strings attached. It was never no charge. It would go to receiver, but then the receiver had certain obligations to give back to the giver. Now the receiver was poorer and so would not be able to respond on a, in a financially equal way, but would have to give service or give time or do other things to serve the patron. So that sense of uh, the circle of reciprocity, I have been giving something that places me under obligation, I'm to give back, is the way that the world worked in that day. Peter writes this, that in ancient Greece, as well as in Rome, the benefit gratitude system was interwoven with the pursuit of honor. A patron expected his clients to form an entourage to blow trumpets and shout his praises as the patron passed through the streets of Rome. And then uh, there would actually be a title. Euagertes was the Greek word for it, but the Romans would call it a benefactor. Benefactor uh, 
would sponsor the building of an aqueduct or a hippodrome or a temple in a city, sponsor poetry, athletic contests, and then would expect honor, acclaim, and praise, and other services from the people who were benefited by this. So there was this constant circle of reciprocity. And it served to keep the people who had a lot in a position of high power and high status. It served to form a society where there was a deep sense of inequality. People were not equal in worth. They were not equal in dignity. They were not equal in value. And there was a constant strain. Now, Israel had a different notion of gratitude and uh, a different notion of thanksgiving, and that was that God is the giver of every good and perfect gift, and so we owe our thanks to him. And all human beings are made in his image, and God is concerned for them all, particularly for the poor, so that one of the ways that we show our gratitude to the God who gives us all gifts is that we give. There's actually a proverb that says that the one who gives to the poor, to the needy, lends to the Lord. And we might think about it like this, that uh, in this circle, and Jesus is the one who taught about this in a revolutionary way, um, uh, there is an infinite expansion of the circle of generosity, but it involves free gifts from God. God is a generous God, and the whole project of creation is God's goodness and God's generosity. That's why there's 300,000 species of beetles. That's why there is so much lavish detail to creation. God loves to give. And then as a little tiny part of God's project of generosity, these gifts come to us, my body, my parents, my life, money that comes to me, my clothes. And that comes to me so that I can be part of this great project. My gratitude goes not to some human being that I'm under obligations to keep them propped up, but back to God. And the way that I express that is to give, particularly to be generous to those who are in need, not with strings attached so that they will give back to me. I'm not worried about that. Freely you have received, freely you give, I give to them. And somehow when I give to the least of these, Jesus is present with them. God is present with them because God loves them. And that becomes part of this great project of generosity that goes on throughout the world. And so Jesus brings this. And because he breaks the circle of reciprocity, Because he says now human interactions are not designed to prop up people that have power or status in perpetuity. He he was viewed, early Christians were viewed in the ancient Greco-Roman world as ingrates because they did not participate in that very limited circle of reciprocity. So you might remember Jesus says, when you give, do not blow trumpets the way that the hypocrites do. That's in Matthew chapter 6. But give in secret, and the Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. We become part of that circle of generosity. Or Peter writes about this. Uh, The gospel liberates us, not just from sin, but from social patterns and institutions that serve the powerful as tools of enslavement and domination. Jesus instructs his disciples not to act like Gentile benefactors. That's in the book of Luke. He actually uses that phrase, who lord it over their subjects. As everyone well knew at the time, this is not sarcasm or hyperbole, but a perfectly scientific description of how Roman and Jewish rulers operated. They gave to impose debts and obligations of obedience on those beneath them. They gave with the expectation that repayment would come around that way. I'm back. You may not have noticed, but we had a slight equipment malfunction and it's fixed and I'm grateful. Now the invitation for you today is to think about ways that God is blessing you for which you can be grateful around the word gifts. Robert Emmons writes, these gifts may be simple everyday pleasures, people in your life, personal strengths or talents, moments of natural beauty, gestures of kindness from others. We might not usually think about these things as gifts, but that's the way to think about them right now. Use the word gifts, or even I am gifted. We'll often restrict that kind of language to a certain group of people that have great intelligence or or are better than us in some ways, but actually every one of us is gifted. But now that reflection on having been gifted 
will give rise to the desire to give to others, to expand the circle of reciprocity. So that's the second part of this exercise. Ask, in what ways might I give back to others as an appropriate response for the gratitude that I feel? Um, who can you tell about this gift that you received? Can you pay it forward? Offer to pay for somebody's coffee behind you in line or for somebody's toll if you're going through a toll plaza in your car or uh, the car behind you, behind you in the fast food drive through lane. Do an errand for somebody who is a neighbor. I think of my friend Ron who just gets so excited about taking a 91-year-old neighbor to the grocery store. Or I think about Art years ago who was in his 90s and our house had gotten TP'd and he came over, got out a rake and started helping us. Who can, you, who can you pay it forward to? How can you give back today? Freely you have received. Freely give. We have a lot to be grateful for. Thanks for joining us. To receive the emails that go along with each video, visit becomenew.me slash subscribe. If you'd like a text alert whenever a new video is posted, text the word become to the phone number 855-888-0444. You can send prayer requests to that number as well. To invite a friend, just share the link becomenew.me. We'll see you next time.